This week we look at thin-walled cylindrical pressure vessels and an everyday example of such a vessel would be something like this compressor tank, a small portable workshop compressor and here is the tank which is cylindrical. You can see it's round in cross-section and has hemispherical, semi-hemispherical ends. You can see a welded joint over there and there's more than likely another joint underneath that you can't see along the length of the vessel. But this vessel is made of steel in this case and it is relatively thin walled in relation to its size. That's not clearly defined what that relationship is but let's just pick some arbitrary numbers. Let's make this 500 millimeters diameter and let's make the thickness of the steel somewhere around 3 millimeters and that would be considered a thin walled pressure vessel. Now if you imagine that vessel having pressure inside of it greater than the outside air pressure, in this case compressed air, the vessel would be trying to rupture and in so doing it would be creating stresses in the walls of the vessel and they would all be tensile stress. As you can well imagine the vessel is trying to get larger because of the pressure inside of it so it is subjected to tensile stress or the, the material that makes up the cylinder is experiencing tensile stress. Now we'll be categorizing the stress into two types. We'll be call, talking about longitudinal stress and circumferential stress. Now you must be careful with the wording because it can get confusing. Longitudinal stress runs along the length of the vessel. Let's call it the long axis of the vessel. It reminds you that it is the longitudinal stress. Whereas circumferential stress is at 90 degrees to that and it is along this imaginary joint, this longitudinal joint. So if you pictured the vessel having a longitudinal joint, across that joint would be tense a cir correction circumferential stress trying to tear that joint apart. And in a similar fashion, if you were looking at a circumferential joint, such as this one, it would have longitudinal stress trying to rip the vessel apart along that seam over there, that imaginary seam. Now let's deal with the circumferential stress first, which by the way is often referred to as hoop stress. So hoop or circumferential stress is best understood by looking at half of the vessel, such as this sketch over here, and looking at the projected area of that cylinder, which would be a rectangle ultimately. And then considering the pressure that is inside the vessel, which is now in effect acting on a rectangular shape over there. And we know that pressure is force over area and alt instead force is also equal to then pressure times area. So pressure multiplied by the area that it's acting on, which is that projected area we spoke of, DL, is equal to the resisting force and we know that force is stress times area. So there is the stress we're dealing with multiplied by the area that is resisting that stress. Now let's have a look where 2TL came from. T is the thickness of the material that's across here, that small dimension, times L would be the area of this shaded portion over here. And of course there are two of them, one on that side, one on this side, resisting the force. So if there were no actual joint there and we were just considering it as an imaginary joint, then the stress in that imaginary joint would simply be PD over 2T. However, if there is in fact a real joint there, perhaps a welded seam along there, and we talk of that joint having an efficiency of whatever, we must then further factor the stress and increase it if that efficiency is not 100%. And that would be because of the welding process or the joining process. Let's say it results in a strength half as much as the surrounding material, then that joint would be said to be 50% efficient and we would then increase the stress accordingly by dividing by joint efficiency. So if we divide by 0.5, we increase the stress, we double the stress. And that is how you cater for a real joint whose efficiency is less than 100%. In other words, where the joint is weaker than the surrounding material. Now at 90 degrees to all of that, we have longitudinal stress where we consider the cross-sectional area shaded over here. 
once again we deal with the internal pressure which is acting on an area of or is being resisted rather by an area of pi dt pi d being the circumference of this circle multiplied by the thickness of the material and as before pressure times projected area now projected area is this inside circle which would be pi over 4 d squared so there we have the force tending to separate and the force resisting and we end up with pd over 40 and once again if there is a real joint a welded seam such as in the case of our compressor you clearly saw the welded seam over here there was a seam so if we had such a seam and its efficiency was less than 100 percent in other words it was weaker than the surroundings we would insert that efficiency below the line here and let's once again say it was 50 percent so we would have 0.5 over there we would be dividing by a number smaller than one and we would be increasing the stress accordingly to cater for that suboptimal joint in the material so here's a very simple example to get started an air receiver has an internal pressure of 1600 kilopascals Please write that as lowercase k, capital P, lowercase a. Internal and external diameters of 1.5 meters and 1.532 meters determine the hoop and longitudinal stresses. So the 1 is PD over 2T, as you know, and you insert the relevant numbers. Pressure in pascals, diameter in meters, over 2 times the thickness of the wall. Now the thickness of the wall you found by taking that number and subtracting from it that number and dividing by 2 to find the wall thickness. So you find 75 megapascals. And then PD over 40 for the other stress, we find a lower stress of 37.5 megapascals. And there are no joints spoken of, so there are no joint efficiencies to concern ourselves with, with example 1. So to recap, longitudinal stress is less than circumferential stress. In fact, it is half as much, and that is assuming there are no joints involved with joint efficiencies. Example 2 is a small derivation. We must obtain an expression for the hoop stress induced in a thin spherical vessel subjected to an internal pressure. And you do get such vessels, which are perfect spheres. So there is a cross section through the spherical vessel and once again we've got a projected area of a circle and we use exactly the same method force tending to separate the two halves pressure times area equals resisting force which is stress times the area resisting the tension so it would be that shaded area over there so we have a very similar formula to before pd over 40. and in case you need need it pi over 6 d cubed is the volume of a sphere Example 3 involves joint efficiencies. We have a thin cylindrical vessel, 1.2 internal diameter, made of metal 12 millimeters thick. Ultimate tensile stress of this metal is 460 megapascals. If the efficiencies of the, of the longitudinal and circumferential joints are 83 and 49% respectively, and a factor of safety of 8 is to be used, determine the maximum pressure to which this vessel may be subjected. Let's start by looking at the longitudinal joint. Now remember the longitudinal joint is the one where you use the circumferential stress formula PD over 2T and the efficiency that goes in there is that for the longitudinal joint. So this is where you could get confused but don't because we simply say consider longitudinal joint which has circumferential stress which has longitudinal joint efficiency. You plug in the numbers and you find that 954 megapascals is usable for that joint and remember that you divided your stress by eight because of the safety factor then consider the circumferential joint which has longitudinal stress but circumferential joint efficiency which goes in there at 0.49 safety factor as usual on the left dividing the stress by eight and you find that 1127 kilopascals is possible considering the circumferential joint so if our vessel can handle 1127 kilopascals under these conditions and it can only handle 954 under those conditions what can we 
go to safely? Well, clearly we can't go here because the vessel has already failed at 954. So the limiting number, the one to choose, is the lesser in this case. Maximum allowable pressure is therefore only 954. We can't get here because the vessel is already damaged at this point. So there's the answer. Right, so here's the tutorial. I'd like you to stop the video as usual and go through these, make an attempt on at all four and look very carefully at not getting confused between circumferential joints, longitudinal joints. Go through that previous example we did and there should be no surprises in all of these over here. In this number two, you're solving for the diameter of the vessel. And you find that you have a diameter of 3.017 meters there and a bigger one over there. And you've got to choose which is the maximum allowable. You've got to take the lesser again, because the bigger you go on the diameter, the harsher the design is. So in this case, you've got to choose the lesser of the two diameters. Remember? Less diameter means less projected area, which means less force, which means less stress ultimately. In number three, you have a cylindrical vessel with all its specifications, including the metal thickness, and you must replace it with a spherical vessel having the same internal volume. So it must hold the same amount of uh, well, volume. Determine the internal diameter and metal thickness for the spherical vessel. So we start by finding the required internal diameter of the spherical vessel. We know everything about the cylinder. So there's its volume, cross-sectional area times length, and the volume of a sphere, as we know, is pi d cubed over 6. And we solve for the required diameter at 1.2 meters. Now the maximum stress in the walls of the cylindrical vessel is PD over 2T, and that's going to be made equal to PD over 4T, and the good news is that a spherical vessel does not have PD over 2T anywhere in it because it only has the lesser of the two stresses, PD over 4T, by nature of its design. So it comes out requiring a lesser wall thickness than the cylindrical vessel. Now our final example relates to an accumulator, in this case an air accumulator. Now an air accumulator works as follows. You connect this to your system, your in this case high pressure air system. So the high pressure air enters this vessel, which in this case happens to have a curved end and then a cylindrical shape. And this high pressure is inside this space and it acts on a piston, which is sealed to the walls of the cylinder. And then the piston acts against a spring which is contained at the top here. So the more pressure you have, the harder the piston pressures, presses against the spring and the shorter the spring becomes. And the purpose of the accumulator is to store a little bit of high pressure air in the system and allow the compressor to maybe stop for a moment and then the spring extends and gives the system that same high pressure supply. So it's a short term storage area really for an air or hydraulic system. In the previous section we learnt about spring solid length and we are told here that the spring solid length is 80 millimeters. What that means is when this piston is at its highest point and the spring has become solid all the coils are touching and we have 80 millimeters from here to wherever the piston now is. So we start by working out what the strongest spring is that we can possibly put in this space. So we are limited by solid length, we are limited by free length, and we are limited by the space available. In other words, the diameter of the outside of the coils can't be bigger than the space available inside. And we've got to find the strongest possible spring that we can build to fit into that space. And we're told that the spring wire to be used is to be 16 millimeters and modulus of rigidity of the material 80 gigapascals. So with all of those numbers and knowing that we 
it may not exceed 300 megapascals of stress in the spring wire. We have a formula for stress versus dimensions and we find that with 300 megapascals and the dimensions given we can't do any more than 8.936 kilonewtons of load in the spring. And knowing that, we can find the maximum air pressure that corresponds to the spring fully compressed. Because pressure is load over area, so there's our load over the area of the piston. So the pressure must be 505.86 kilopascals of pressure. That's the highest we can have in this accumulator. Now we need to design the actual pressure vessel which only has one joint we are told down here where the end cap is welded to the cylindrical portion. The cylindrical portion itself has no joints in it. It's machined from a solid billet. So looking at the longitudinal stress first, that is the one where we're going to use the circumferential joint efficiency. And we're allowed 60 megapascals. There's the dimensions, there's the efficiency. So we need 0.42 millimeters only when considering that. We must also consider the circumferential stress where we have no joint, so the joint efficiency goes to 1 and we find 0.632 millimeters. Okay, now we can't take 0.42 because we needed 0.6 to sort this out, so we must take the bigger. So 0.632 millimeters would be adequate, but we could round off in realistically to the next size of 0.7 millimeters. But in real life, you probably can't buy a 0.7 millimeter plate. So you would have to use one millimeter for manufacturing. But anyway, this is not cast in stone. The fact of the matter is 0.632 millimeters is the thinnest we can go to satisfy 